I'm going to give a little bit of an analysis. I'm sure y'all have seen it on social media. And uh, I know pretty much every content creator I know, every every colleague and comrade of mine has been covering it pretty extensively. But uh, I'm going to give my own analysis of the... Uh, <clears throat> of the absolutely disastrous um, fucking Joe Biden interview. I'm going to give my own take from a, from a psych perspective, um, not only on just the, um, the symptoms I see uh, throughout just the interview itself, um, but also some psychology behind the answers that are being given. We're not going to go through the whole thing. I don't want to put you guys through half an hour. All right, so we're just going to kick this off right from the beginning here. And uh, I'm going to pause it occasionally and kind of give my uh, give my personal analysis on the answers here and kind of the psychology behind the answers and what they really mean. Because for those who didn't tune in, some of y'all just didn't want to see this. Maybe some of y'all are too traumatized by the debate. You don't ever want to hear the word Biden again. Maybe you gave up on the whole political apparatus. Maybe you're maybe you're living in the woods and you just want to watch me play some games. And don't worry, we will get to that. Uh, but yeah, without further ado, let's uh, let's kick this piece of shit off. Is this a bad episode with a sign of a more serious condition? Okay. Let's start with the debate. Uh, you and your team said have said you had a bad night, but your but your friend Nancy Pelosi actually framed oh. the question I think is on the minds of millions of Americans. Was this a bad episode? with a sign of a more serious condition. It's a bad episode. Uh, no indication of any serious condition. I was exhausted. I did less than my instincts in terms of preparing and uh, bad nights. You know, you say you were exhausted, and, and I know you've said that before as well, but you came and you did have a tough month, but you came home from Europe about 11 or 12 days before the debate, spent six days in Camp David. Why wasn't that enough? Hold on, I gotta look, look at his face. <laughs> I'm sorry, I gotta have a bit of a laugh here. Look at his face. This motherfucker has the worst, like, old man, Bill Burr, like, he's staring at the Reaper, okay? He's staring. He's staring at the, the pearly gates. Actually, given his fucking history, he's staring at fire and brimstone, probably. Six days in Camp David. Why wasn't that enough rest time, enough recovery time? Because I was sick. I was feeling terrible. Matter of fact, the docs with me, I asked if they did a COVID test because they were trying to figure out what's wrong. They did a test to see whether or not I had uh, some infection, you know, a virus. I didn't. They just had a really bad cold. And <clears throat> okay. So I'm just going to lay a bit of the groundwork here. Um, Having studied a lot of Joe Biden's mannerisms, his cadence, and his general behavior over a long period of time, um, it should be painfully evident to anyone whatsoever. It should be painfully evident to anyone whatsoever that Joe Biden is a narcissist. Um, he is. He has exhibited um, countless narcissistic traits. Uh, from a profound lack of empathy to a an excessive need for admiration. Um, <clears throat> so what he's doing here, and I'll give him the benefit uh, benefit of the doubt, okay? Because he this could be from his team. They're giving him like answers. They're coaching him, and as we all know, his brain's just basically macaroni and cheese as of this point. If some if some noodles came out the ear right now, I wouldn't really be surprised. Um, but the reason why he needs to frame it as a, I, and, and this is something narcissists do as well when they're lying, um, they will, they will kind of gish gallop, um, they will gish gallop excuses. Um, because if you notice the first answer was I was exhausted. Now we've all been exhausted when I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm, I'm dumb as fuck when I'm exhausted. Um, <clears throat> But he doesn't stop at exhausted. And you'll see this with a lot of liars. They'll, 
they won't just give you one excuse. They'll give you a bunch of excuses. And the intention there is to condition you to thinking, I shouldn't be too hard on this person because they seem like there's just a whole ton of stuff going on. So he could have just led with, I'm exhausted and just called it, called it a day. But now he's exhausted. Plus, he has a cold, and it's a really bad cold to the point where his staff was super concerned. Um, again, this is a this is a tactic that liars use uh, a lot. There won't ever just be one reason. They will they will pepper you with reason after reason because the uh, the intention is to get you get you to stop uh, being on the offensive and put you in a more defensive state or even like an empathetic state. Um, anyway. Did, did you ever watch the debate afterwards? I don't think I did, no. <clears throat> That's very telling. A lot of people probably didn't catch essentially, um, a lot of people probably didn't catch the significance of that, but Joe Biden is obviously in in so, in some capacity when he in the four point five seconds a day that he's fucking lucid and actually with it, he obviously knows he had a bad debate. He's he's forced to admit it on live TV now. A normal person would review that debate and go, "Oh wow, that's really bad. I need to look into this and review it and see how I can do better." But narcissists can't do that because be, behind the grandiose shell, the uh, the like superiority uh, aura that a lot of narcissists have, there is deep, deep shame. And in order to deflect from that shame, you can never face it. So the fact that he never even watched the debate, which... I mean, that's that's crazy, right? If you had a debate, you'd want to watch it and get better, especially if you know you've got another fucking debate, probably. But again, narcissists can't do that. They can't face their own inadequacies. That's why narcissists create this false uh, self to begin with. It's because they can't face those inadequacies. Um, yeah, just wanted to point that out real quick. Well, what, I'm trying, what I want to get at is that what were you experiencing as you were going through the debate? Did you know how badly it was going? Yeah, look. The whole way I prepared, nobody's fault of mine. Nobody's fault of mine. I, uh, I prepared what I usually would do, sitting down, as I did come back with foreign leaders or the National Security Council, for explicit detail. And I realized about partway through that, you know, all the, I could quote at the New York Times had me down at 10 points before the debate, nine now or whatever the hell it is. The fact of the matter is that what I looked at is that he also lied 28 times. I couldn't, I mean, the way the debate ran, not my fault, no one else's fault, no one else's fault. But it but, seemed like you were having trouble from the first question in, even before he spoke. Notice, um, <clears throat> this is kind of uh, something to take note of as well. Now, he says multiple times, it's, it's nobody's fault but mine. Um, but every time he does that, he presents excuses and, and ways to shift the accountability from his inadequacies to another party. So he says no one's fault but mine, but... Trump was like lying a ton. Um, you know, he he was just he was he he was lying like twenty six times, and I'll be the first one to agree with him. Trump lied his fucking ass off the whole night. But guess what, Joe? That's Trump. He's been a pathological liar, a documented pathological liar, con man, and fucking scammer his whole life. He has never not been an absolute walking toilet. So, <clears throat> you know this, you're aware of how much he lies, because obviously you've, you've commented on it before, you've observed it before. So, again, the framing of, we call it, a, in psychology, we call it a, a narcology. 
And you guys may have experienced this with maybe a friend, maybe a lover, um, hopefully not uh, a parental figure who may have strong narcissistic traits. Um, it's, it's the I'm sorry, but. So they give an apology, but it has to be immediately followed up by deflecting accountability to an external object. He can't just, this could have been over in five minutes if he had just admitted, yeah, you know what? I had a bad night. Um, yeah, I just wasn't with it. My head was soupy and, 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 and deep fried. I had a deep fried brain that night. I stuck my head in the deep fryer and I was like, I want my head to be like a, a KFC bucket of chicken. But again, narcissists can't do that. And even though his brain is clearly melting, um, you know, those personality traits are very strong. Those personality traits are going to stay. They might even be more stubborn than a lot of memories. So. Well, I just had a bad night. You got some bad memories once in a while. I can't remember any. I'm sure you do. I've had plenty. Check that out, too. Now, narcissists do this as well. When they are, when they are pushed, when they feel like they are on the defensive or they're being criticized um, to a point where their their fr very fragile egos can't handle it, they will they will try to uh, take control back because for narcissists, everything is about control. Now, George isn't letting them off the fucking hook here. Okay, he's been very just tunnel vision of like, no, 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 I'm, I, I need to get this out of you. So what he is doing, he's pushing back and saying, on a bad night, you've had bad nights before, I'm sure, blah, blah, blah. He's trying to elicit like, he's essentially trying to redirect the conversation to paint George as the unfair one, who again, is just giving an interview and Biden agreed to the interview because of course he did. His narcissism compels him to change the narrative. He can't handle the narrative that he is an old man that's falling apart. And I've said this several times, but there is nothing more tragic than a narcissist in decline. And you'll see this with a lot of people with narcissistic traits as they get older, as they get sick. Um, if anything major happens to them that befalls them in life, they will, they will engage in very erratic behavior, and that's because they do not have control over that situation. Joe Biden does not have control over his dementia. He doesn't have control over his age. He doesn't have control, more importantly, over how the public perceives him. That's why I did this interview, and that is why he is trying to reverse, um, reverse the offensive back onto George. I I guess the question, the, the problem is here for a lot of Americans watching, as you've said, going back to 2020, watch me, yep. it, to people who are concerned about your age. And, you know, 50 million Americans watched that debate. It seemed to confirm fears they already had. Well, look, after that debate, I 10 major events in a row, including until 2 o'clock in the morning after that debate. I did events in North Carolina. I did events in, in, in Georgia. Did events like this today. Large crowds, overwhelming response, no, no, no slipping. And so I just had a bad night. I don't know why. And how, how quickly did it, did it? <clears throat> so real quick, this is another thing that Cluster B people are really fucking bad at, and that's consistency. So he's trying to juice up like his performance, his his abilities, his capacity, right? I did 10 events, sometimes still two in the morning. Okay, but Joe, you said earlier the reason why you had a bad night was because you had a cold and you were exhausted. So you can't really be juicing yourself up saying you're this kind of dynamo, as the corporate press likes to say. And simultaneously be arguing that you know, uh, some travel poops you out or Donald Trump was lying and that's why your brain got scrambled or that, you know, you had a cold, right? You got to pick one. You either have to play the, 
I'm just so overworked and I'm, I, I'm like, I'm, you know, ah, I'm drowning in my own oatmeal or whatever the fuck someone that's that old eats. I don't know. Um, definitely not bugs. Like he wants to make all of us eat. Hey, but, um, you know, you got to pick one, but that's another thing that disordered people do. They will, they will completely contradict themselves within within conversations and I'm sure you guys have experienced a lot of this as well Um, and the reason why they do that the reason why they do that is because narcissists in particular and a lot of people with various mental health uh, conditions they are very they are reactive uh, conversationalists meaning that they will completely switch whatever they're going to say or whatever narratives they have um, based on what the person's saying. Because what he's trying to do essentially is he's trying to regain control and, and like grab the narrative. He wants to get the interviewer to back off and start like dancing to his tune. And George isn't dancing to his tune here, which is very interesting. Very fucking interesting. It's interesting how all of the corporate press isn't dancing to his tune right now. But, um, yeah, so that's just another thing uh, I noticed right off the bat. Come to you that you were having that bad night. Well, Kane and I was having a bad night when I realized that even when I was answering a question when I turned his mic off and he was still shouting. And I, I let it distract me. I, I'm not blaming on that. But I realized that I just wasn't in control. Part- very te- two very telling things there. So first and foremost, he keeps saying, I'm not blaming this. I, I, I'm not making excuses. But every time he does that, it's after he makes an excuse. And again, I realized I was having a bad night because he kept shouting, which first off, I didn't hear that. I heard about like 586 lies from from Zion Don over there. I uh, I heard him literally say Israel needs to finish the job, which means exactly what you fucking think it is. Think it does rather. Sorry. Had a bad moment. Um, I was tired. But um, he keeps he keeps doing this thing where he's saying, I'm not blaming that, but he's providing an excuse that is deflecting from him actually owning um, his poor debate performance. And I I haven't watched this in full. I checked uh, I checked out Heartlands Media. I checked out a bunch of other uh, content creators. Uh, their takes on it were fantastic as always. But um, I haven't like had a, a chance to like dive into the beginning of this because I feel like the beginning wasn't super covered. So I'm kind of just going at this real time. But yeah, that's uh, that's fascinating. Another thing too, he said I didn't feel like I was in control. He's telling on himself there because, again, narcissists always need control. Unless he means, like, I was literally not in control. Like, I was not in control of my body. Like, I filled my diaper to the brim, and I felt a little, like, a leak down the leg a little bit. I'm not sure. Part of the other concern is that uh, this seems to have fit into a pattern of decline that has been reported on recently. New York Times had a headline on July 2nd, Biden's lapses are said to be increasingly common and worrisome. Here's what they wrote. People who have spent time with President Biden over the last few months or so said the lapses appear to have grown more frequent, more pronounced, and after Thursday de- Thursday's debate, more worrisome. By many accounts, as evidenced by video footage, observation, and interviews, Mr. Biden is not the same today as he was even when he took office three and a half years ago. Similar reporting in the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. Are you the same man today that you were when you took office three and a half years ago? In terms of successes, yes. I also was the guy who put together a peace plan for the Middle East that made me come into fruition. I was also the guy that expanded NATO. I was also the guy that grew the economy. 
was also the guy that expanded NATO. I'm st- <laughs> sorry. I just his his face is killing me. The level of like propagandize you have to be to be like, oh, he expanded NATO. Well, that's fucking based. Slay, queen. Um, I have no words. All the individual things that were done were ideas I had or I fulfilled. I moved on. And so, for example, you know, well, well that was true then. What's Biden done lately? Did you just see today? Just announced 200,000 new jobs. We're moving in the direction that no one's ever taken on. I know you know this from the days in the, in the, in the, in the government. I took on Big Pharma. I beat them. No one said I could beat them. I took on all the things we No, Joe, you beat Medicare, remember? <laughs> this, this is interesting because this is, in my opinion, an example of grandiose thinking, okay? Because to state that you took on Big Pharma and you beat them after your administration, after your administration, essentially dance to the tune of Big Pharma to the point where you were ready to get to use um fuck what's it called um I'm having a brain fart but basically to the point where you were trying to get vaccine mandates implemented on a fucking country wide level Okay, the fact that you can actually say you beat Big Pharma, which, first of all, what exactly did you beat? Okay, Big Pharma practically owns our media here in Canada as well as the States. The idea that you beat Big Pharma, where it is one of the most corrupt, unregulated industries in the world, is an example of grandiose thinking. <clears throat> and that's because narcissists always have to preserve their sense of grandiosity. They always have to... And by the way, I could do any interview with Trump and and give these exact same arguments. Because I might actually do that as a comparison one day. Because Trump has the exact same traits Biden does. These people, personality-wise, are extremely similar. It's just Biden has a better facade. There's two types of narcissists. There's a overt or grandiose narcissist, and there is a covert or a vulnerable narcissist. Biden used to be a grandiose narcissist, but what happened was he he had too many repeated wounds to his ego, and so he switched it up to becoming a vulnerable or covert narcissist, where a lot of the time... You, you play like you're a good person. You play like you're a downtrodden and, you know, underdog sort of person. Trump is a grandiose narcissist. He'll just say, I'm the greatest thing ever a million times a day. And he'll criticize anyone who doesn't just immediately go, yes, you're the greatest person ever. Um, but yeah, ludicrous shit like I beat Big Pharma. It's just like normal people don't say shit like that. Because you know you haven't, but you have to maintain that aura of superiority at all times. Said we got done. We we're told we couldn't get done. And part of it is what I said when I ran was I wanted to do three things: restore some decency to the office, restore some supports for the middle class instead of trickle down economics, both from the middle out and the bottom up, the way the wealthy still do find everyone does better, and unite the country. But what has all that? Again, grandiose thinking. The three things he listed off there, none of them came true. There was no decency to the office because there was never any decency to begin with. Look at the history of, of look at the history of presidents. Look at uh, look at all the scandals. Look at all the corruption. I mean, fuck. I remember you all remember the Clinton days. So the idea that he's restoring anything is ludicrous. If anything, what he means by restoring decency is I don't think Trump did a good enough job job hiding his sociopathy. 
So I, I restored the, the false image of decency that the liberal class is so in love with. Work over the last three and a half years cost you physically, mentally, emotionally. Well, I, I just think it cost me a really bad night, bad run. But, you know, I, George, I, I have, I'm optimistic about this country. I don't think we're a country of losers in parts out. I don't think America's in tough shape. I think America's on the cusp of breaking through on so many incredible opportunities. In this next term, I'm gonna make sure we have a, a straighten out the tax system. I'm gonna make sure we're in a situation where we have health care for all people, or we're in a position where we have, have child care and elder care, free up, and all these things. One thing I'm proudest of, is remember when my economic plan was put forward, a lot of the mainstream economists said it's not going to work. Guess what? They now have 16 Nobel laureates, 16 of them in economics, saying that Biden's next term would be, based on what he wants to do, enormous success. Trump's plan would cause a recession, would significantly increase inflation. I've made great progress, and that's what I plan on doing, and we can do this. I, I, I understand that, and I'm not disputing that. What I'm asking you is, uh, about your personal situation, do you just... <clears throat> so, again, narcissists are famous for this. Remember what the actual question was. He didn't give an actual answer. He started listing off all of his qualifications, all of his pedigrees, most of which were lies. Lies are half-truths. Um, let's not... You know, let's not spin yarns here. Um, but it got to the point where George had to redirect the question back because it wasn't answered. And say what you want about George Stephanopoulos. Thank God I got his name right. Um, but this is this is good journalism, what he's doing right here. OK, because that's what you want to do in an interview. OK, you need to constantly be going did this person answer this question? And if they didn't, you you have to press them to answer it again. I mean, we saw it in the debate, uh, several questions, if memory serves, where Trump was asked a question and he, he went off into this fucking Adderall lace tirade about, well, let's be real, 80% of it was just, let's blame every problem on the border. Let's, it, it, Trump essentially just did the South Park episode. You know, they took our jobs, but um, they had to redirect the question back because it's like you didn't answer the question. Here you go. Answer the question. That's what he's doing right here. Dispute that there have been more lapses, especially in the last several months. Can I run the 110 flat? No, but I'm still in good shape. Are you more frail? No. I know you I'm spoke my schedule. <laughs> I know you spoke with your doctor after the debate. What did he say? He said he just looked at me. He said you're exhausted. I said I have medical doctors traveling everywhere every president does, as you know. Medical doctors from the best in the world travel me everywhere I go. I have an ongoing assessment of what I'm doing. And they don't hesitate to tell me if they think there's something wrong. I know you said you have an ongoing assessment. Have you had a full neurological and cognitive evaluation? I, bet I get a full neurological test every day with me. <clears throat> so this is heavy, heavy doubling down. You can't get a full neurological test every day. That's that's not even that's not even realistic. Because a full neurological test involves a battery of different tests that sometimes involve a CT scan, an MRI, sometimes double contrast or contrast, which involves putting dye into your veins. Um, these don't take like five minutes. Okay, having a full workup of, of neurological tests isn't something you can just wake up and fit into your day, especially if, as he's saying before, um, 
if as he's saying before, his schedule's so jam packed. Uh, that's just not realistic. I've I've had them myself, and I know what the tests are. Um, so this is an example of him really doubling down. And again, the comment about like my doctor said you're exhausted. I mean, we don't know what his doctor really said, but I find it a little coincidental that his doctor somehow completely agrees with his narrative entirely. And I've had a full physical. I had, you know, I mean, I, I've been a ball to read for my physicals. I mean, yes. I, I know your doctor said he consulted with a neurologist. I, I guess I'm asking a, a slightly different question. Have you had the specific cognitive tests and have you had a neurologist, a specialist, do an examination? No, no one said I had to. No one said they said I'm good. Would you be willing to undergo an independent medical evaluation that included neurological and cognitive, cognitive tests and release the results to the American people? Look, I have a cognitive test every single day. Every day I have that test. Everything I do. You know, not only am I campaigning, but I'm running the world. Not, and that's not how it sounds like hyperbole. But we are the central nation of the world. I don't know if was right. And every single day, for example, today, before I come out here, I'm on the phone. China would like a word. Call with the with Prime Minister of, I shouldn't get into detail, but with Netanyahu, I'm on the phone with the new Prime Minister of England. I'm working on what we're doing with regard to, in Europe, with regard to expansion of NATO and whether it's going to stick. I'm taking on Putin. I mean, every day, there's no day I go through that are not those decisions I have to make every single day. And you have been doing that, and the American people have been watching, yet their concerns about your age and your health are growing. So that's why I'm asking, could, to reassure them, would you be willing to have the independent medical evaluation? <laughs> Watch me between, there's a lot of time left in this campaign. It's over 125 days. So the answer, the, decision. the right answer right now is no, you, you don't want to do that right no, now. I've already done it. So when, when there is a challenge, um, a challenge, because he essentially said, would you be willing to back up everything you're saying by having an independent body that is unbiased, uninfluenced, all of that, come in, check you the fuck out, and then release to the public the results of that. So a couple interesting things here. He went from, I have a cognitive test every single day, to, nope, I've never had like a neurological test, to the answer to that, I have a cognitive test every single day. And then a deflection after that. So basically what he is admitting, and narcissists do this a lot too, is they're willing to play various linguistic games with you. They're, they're willing to... Conversation is very much like a, like a chess match, I suppose. But when it came down to it, the meat and potatoes of it, of like, okay, I'm hearing what you're saying. Would you be willing to have that backed up? And because everything he's saying here is probably false. He tried the deflection and George, props to him, he brought it back and said, okay, so what is the answer here? As you noticed, he had to present that question twice and then push for the answer. And obviously the answer is no, because we're not going to be getting a independent assessment of his mental health. So. You talked a lot about your successes in the, at the beginning of this interview, and, and I don't want to dispute that. I don't want to debate that. But as you know, elections are about the future, not the past. They're about tomorrow, not yesterday. And the question on so many people's minds right now is, can you serve effectively for the next four years? George. I'm the guy that put NATO together, the future. No one thought I could expand it. I'm the guy that shut the hell down. No one thought it could happen. I'm the guy that put together. <clears throat> Another obvious uh, example of grandiose thinking. 
um, how did how did how did you shoot Putin down? What did you do by funding Ukraine? How did you shut him down? He like he thinks America's a joke, and the thing with Putin is he doesn't even have a and and there's there's interviews where he blatantly says this. He doesn't even have like a opinion about the president because he legitimately says we covered this on politically homeless a little bit. The president doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who's in office. The pre- it, it's meaningless. But I mean, shutting Putin down. What does that mean? Putin's a part of Putin got into BRICS. He's a part of Russia. He's working with China, and they're winning. They're winning in Ukraine. And that's because of you and your allies. They're still at war because of you and your fucking allies. So, again, that's another example of grandiose thinking. Because in no way, shape, or form did he shut Putin down. But also, did he say he created NATO? I Was that just like a... I, I'm going to chalk that up to a brain fart and I'm going to be charitable to Biden here because he has obviously has dementia. We, we assume, but it's most likely the case or Louis bodies. There's a lot of different uh, theories, but there's obviously some cognitive issues here. Um, <clears throat> a lot of this could be him forgetting, misremembering, but I'm noticing the same personality traits that track with essentially his personality just as we can observe it and have observed it before. So. South Pacific initiatives with AUKUS. I'm the guy that got 50 nations, out, not only in Europe, outside of Europe as well, to help Ukraine. I'm the guy that got Japanese to expand their budget. I'm the, so, I mean, these, and for example, when I decided we used to have 40% of the computer chip, and we invented the chip, that was all the chip, the computer chip. It's in everything from cell phone to weapons. And so we used to have 40%, we're down to virtually nothing. So I get in the plane against the advice of everybody, and I fly to South Korea. I convince them to invest in the United States, billions of dollars. Now we have tens of billions of dollars being invested in the United States, making us back in a position where we're gonna own that industry again. We have, I mean, I, I guess, anyway, I'm, I don't want to take too much credit. I have a great staff. But all the, my, I guess my point is all that takes a toll. Remember what he said, all that takes a toll, but uh, <clears throat> again, again, he's very quick to say, I don't want to give myself too much credit, um, not making an excuse, but here he just gave himself in an, in, in, uh, an unbelievably grandiose amount of credit. And then he goes, I don't want to give myself too much credit. So again, it's these it's these contradictions within the dialogue tree of narcissistic people that you really have to look for. Do you have the mental and physical capacity to do it for another four years? I believe so. I wouldn't be around if I didn't think I did. Look, I'm running again because I think I understand best what has to be done take this nation to a completely new level. We're on our way. We're on our way. And look, the decision recently made by the Supreme Court on immunity, you know, the next president of the United States, it's not just about whether he or she knows what they're doing. It's, it's, it's not, not about a, con- a conglomerate of people making decisions. It's about the character of the president. The character of the president is going to determine whether or not this constitution is employed the right way. That's about as much as I can stomach. Yeah, I hope you guys, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, I, I have a blast uh, doing psych analysis, especially for politicians, because the overwhelming majority of them, um, the overwhelming majority of them are like, let's be real. It attracts a lot of people with cluster B traits. Um, a lot of people with narcissistic, dark triad, sociopathic, um, those kind, <coughs> excuse me, those kind of traits. Um, 
it's part and parcel of the job. Because, as I've talked about endlessly, um, politicians don't work for you. The purpose of the politician under the capitalist structure is to convince the people that they are working for them while working for the rich and powerful. That is the purpose. And in order to do that, you cannot be fucking honest. You can't roll in to an interview and say, yeah, I'm going to try and get that done, but I, I kind of got to get like the corporations to play ball. I kind of got to get my donors in line with that. We'll see what the donors say, if they're going to buy it. I'll try my best. Because then the whole this is a democracy thing completely falls apart. That was that. I hope you guys really enjoyed it. Um, I'm probably going to do more of these. Just kind of psychoanalyze uh, personalities, I suppose, in general, just based on their different mannerisms and how they navigate conversations. But um, obviously, your empathy is going to be triggered watching Biden in the state that in the state that he is in. Um, you know, he's obviously doing very poorly. We see him literally like struggling to finish sentences to find words. Uh, but let me be the first one to say. Um, your empathy is better spent on, I don't know, um, the Palestinians who are being slaughtered because of the direct actions of his government. Your empathy is better spent on the working class people that his policies have devastated. Joe Biden has been an objectively horrible human being for his whole miserable fucking life. He is he is he has done more damage to the United States and the world in his lifetime than almost any other politician I can think of. I'm feeling a bit of, as the Germans say, schadenfreude, which is the glee at the misfortune of someone else when I see this kind of shit. Because I know his narcissism cannot handle what's happening. He doesn't have control of the situation. His party has lost faith in him. He's completely losing the world. And I hate to say it, but uh, that's fucking karma, Joey. That is absolute goddamn karma.